Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz Jessup, and I am Development Lead of IT for Future and the co-chair of the Workability Network at KPMG. I am delighted to be here with everyone today, and I am looking forward to sharing a bit of our experiences that we've had at KPMG around gender diversity within technology and a bit about my wider um, experiences and stories. So first things first, um, I joined KPMG back in 2013 on the Audit School Leaver Programme. So back then, this was a um, degree apprenticeship, essentially, which partnered KPMG with the University of Exeter to um, give people opportunities to go to university who may not have originally had them or who wanted a bit more of a practical approach. So I spent part of my time at the University of Exeter studying towards a degree in accounting and part of my year working at KPMG uh, firstly the London office and then later in their Cambridge office studying for qualification in accounting. Um, I had a great time at the University of Exeter. I really uh, made the most of being given an opportunity to go to university which I didn't think at one point I was going to have. So for two years I was the captain of the debating society and also importantly I worked really closely with the guild around their work um, towards making sure that the University of Exeter was a more inclusive place. I know it's still seen and even more so then was seen as a very elite university and they were working very hard to ensure that everyone felt welcome at Exeter. By my fourth year at university I realised that I hadn't seen any sort of events or any um, sort of programmes that specifically targeted disabled students and I kind of was disappointed <laughs> and angry um, that this was the case, that the university had done great things around sort of supporting the student, female students around students of different races, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, etc, etc, to ensure that the student body was very inclusive, but disabled students hadn't had anything at all. And I realised that a lot of my fellow students who were also disabled, including, um, were very nervous about their next step that universities actually are very inclusive places when it comes to disability. There is often a lot of support. This may not be a universal experience, but often they are very good places in ensuring that people can have the support they need for study. And actually people are very concerned about their next step, that most disabled students will hide their disability during the application process into the workplace, which they wouldn't have done at university. Um, they often suffer from discrimination in the application process. So I wanted to partner the University of Exeter with various sort of companies of different sectors to basically break down these myths, break down these barriers and to give the students the safe space to ask all these questions. So we founded the Disabled Students Forum, which is basically this conference to do just that, which gave students the chance to speak to employers of across the sectors um, to give them an insight into what the application process and also what the world of work would look like, especially around things like flexible working, which is very, very important for, for people with disabilities. Very proud to say that this is now a legacy event and the Guild has adopted this and it's still ongoing in various forms um, and just showcases that actually if you're wanting to be very passionate and if you are very serious as an organisation on inclusion, you need to ensure disability is also covered. I graduated from the University of Exeter in 2017 and qualified as an accountant the year after that. At this point, I was looking to do something a bit different at KPMG. Um, I would spent at that point sort of um, five years working in accounting and then spent sort of six years working in finance. I wanted to do something a little bit different and I'd had this wealth of experience in the University of Exeter and sort of from being the co-chair of the Workability Network at this point that I wanted to do something a bit wider at KPMG around inclusion and diversity and also was very interested in how technology was sort of influencing so many sectors. I got the opportunity to become the development lead of IT as a future back in 2019 and this role has just grown and grown since then. Um, it's now my full-time job and we have recently launched IT as our future which is this umbrella program which aims to bring together all of the grassroots programs like IT as her future um, and our other inclusion and diversity programs in a sort of a space where they, people can share ideas, sort of celebrate each other and ensure that we can grow together to achieve far greater things at KPMG. So what is IT for Future? So IT is Her Future, as I mentioned, is our award-winning gender, gender diversity program within KPMG Technology, which was founded by Anna Smyer back in 2015 and really focuses on ensuring that we have gender parity across our technology departments. As I'm sure everyone here knows, 
uh, technology is an industry which has is underrepresented by women. Um, as of 2017, the female representation of women in technology was 17%, whereas the overall uh, female workforce was at 47%. And the trends are showing that whilst the number of women representing technology fields is going down, the number of women in the overall workforce is going up. So it's actually sort of going in the wrong direction. As you can see here, back in 2015, KPMG already had 26% female headcount, and which was considered good. Like we were above, above average, but that wasn't good enough and it will not be good enough until we have gender parity. So the first things that were done was understanding what was going on. And it was really important for us to baseline all the data. As you can see here, we worked out how many female graduates we had, how many women were applying, how many people were turning us down, how many women were joining us and how many women were being promoted. From this, we could develop an action plan and a strategy, which has taken us forward uh, until today. The first areas we looked at was that recruitment piece. So if you have a 26% female headcount, you need to get more women through the door. And we looked at both the student recruitment path and then the experience hires path. Now, the stuff around student recruitment may seem very sort of basic and easy now, but back in 2015, it was considered quite radical. So it was about just ensuring that if, if we had our, our technology graduate programs no longer required a computer science nor a STEM degree, or we expanded the number of degrees that we would accept, because we realised that when women were joining the firm or men as well, we were having to train them anyway. And actually the skills that we required were universal to any degree and actually a specific technology degree or a specific STEM degree didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily the only option to get those skills. And again, if you're only looking at sort of very specific types of STEM degrees as well, you're automatically going to knock off, really reduce your talent pool to sort of men straight away. Especially if we know around the sort of the stats around sort of um, women at sort of university courses already. That's a very, very easy one. And again, it also means that when sort of your graduates come in, you can ensure you've got a really tailored specific program for them. We also expanded the universities we went to. Um, at that point, it was very much sort of the Ross Group, Redbrook universities. And now we just don't really target them at all um, and have gone for sort of universities with a wider demographic. Those who may not consider KPMG to be the place for them because they think, oh, they wouldn't look at us. We're not a prestigious enough university and really reducing the barriers there. So and instead of doing the sort of traditional milk rounds, we usually now sponsor things like women in business groups or Afro-Caribbean networks as a way of sort of giving a bit more of a focused approach to our student recruitment at universities. We still do a lot of online events and these have been really successful because, again, people want that chance to really talk to people. And it means people feel supported throughout the entire process. In terms of um, graduates, I'm sorry, in terms of experienced hires, um, there was a little bit more to do. And again, sort of technology talent is always, always very, very competitive, um, which we're seeing more and more um, today. So what we did there was we worked very, very closely with our recruitment team. It's really important that you work across all departments, make sure you get them on your side. And so we essentially just asked them why why are you struggling to hire women? And after the first com uh, comment, that which was there aren't any women in technology. And then the second one, if there are there, they are a lot harder to hire than men. We kind of broke down the barriers of, OK, why is this? And it was quite, you know, they were very honest with us. Basically, at that point, people were being remunerated as is very common in recruitment based on the number of people they got into the firm. So they weren't focusing on women as much because they often did ask lots of questions. They went back and forth. They wanted it took a lot more time. So by changing remuneration structures of recruitment teams, it meant that actually the overall quality of our candidates we got in of all genders um, really, really went up. And the other thing is, is we went we expanded the way we looked at looked for talent. So we didn't just do the passive sort of here is a job on our um, jobs board. We actively went out and seeked female talent. We looked at sort of short lists from awards. Um, we did, you know, targeted posting on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, because, you know, we, female talent is out there. You just often have to go looking for it rather than expecting it to come to you. Other things we did, which is something that was mirrored across student recruitment as well, which we sped up our recruitment period. It would take up to six months at times to get a call from KPMG saying that we, you know, we wanted you and we'd give you the offer. And in that time, obviously, people got different jobs and they said yes, because that's a long time to try and hold someone's interest in a very competitive job market. Um, so we re revolutionised that. 
And we also produce these packs, which we call experience hires packs, which we still do. We give these out at conferences. Um, they're now electronic. And essentially those answer the, the questions that people really want to ask, but are never going to ask in the interview setting, which is, you know, what actually is your flexible working policy? Um, how does part time working work in practice? What does consultancy mean? I've only ever worked in industry. And it gives people real life stories of people who work at KPMG or who are managing, you know, having kids or being a carer and ensuring that we can try and answer as many questions as we can. It's very much a show don't tell culture approach, which we found hugely successful and really sort of allows people to feel a lot more confident when they are accepting that offer. A really easy thing to do and, and very, very cheap. So I definitely would recommend doing something like that. As you can see here, these have been really successful. Um, but on top of that, if you sort of get women into the firm, you've also got to make sure they want to stay. Um, often you find that sort of there'll be these big pushes for recruitment of any sort of underrepresented group, but the, the attrition rates will be very, very high because they aren't supported. We've done this in a number of ways. We have dedicated learning and development pathways. We have, importantly, an award winning mentoring program, which you can see on the screen here, which started off again in 2015, was one of the first things done, which now has over 370 mentors sorry, mentees around the world. We also have launched this in the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Australia. We've recently launched in Belgium and in talks with several other countries across KPMG. What we have is a very successful model, which we've managed to adapt across the world um, and has proven some very successful results from it. Our mentoring program is very, very structured and very, very um, dedicated and is all around career progression. That doesn't necessarily mean promotion. We recognise career progression is a very unique thing. And often this is about people transferring teams or going on a secondment somewhere. It's all about ensuring someone is in control of their career and having the support that they need from someone that's not the performance manager to achieve those goals. So, again, we give specific training to both the mentees and mentors on how to get the most out of these relationships. Um, we're building, we've got specific development pathways, which people can complete online. We do events um, during COVID-19, for example. We've got a lot of comments that people were really struggling with the lack of networking um, and that the virtual world, but they were really struggling to navigate this new world. So we set up coffee roulettes to allow people to meet new people. And going forward, we do recognise that people are going to have to get better at navigating virtual and online communication. So we're going to set up some dedicated training just for that. So it's all about listening to our members and responding um, as fast as we can to ensure we are still um, giving people what they need to achieve in their career. As you can see, we've had some su successful results from this, and this really does only touch the surface. We have 16 different work streams. We're all working across the entire career life cycle. Um, we do lots of work in schools. We do lots of work around dedicated to promotions. We do work um, around our apprenticeship streams, etc. So there is lots and lots to do, and it's all about ensuring that no matter where you are in your career, you feel supported and you've got somewhere to go. And these results, again, speak for themselves. So as of 2021, these results I've refreshed in the past couple of weeks. We have a 43% female headcount across our technology departments, um, our female graduates, and this is the intake that came in in October 2020 is 56% female intake and it's looking about the same going forward. Our applicants have jumped up from 15% to 24% and importantly, and I think this is a great statistic, we were often giving out offers to women and they just weren't accepting us for whatever reason. Now we have 95% of job offers that KPMG offer to women are accepted, which is a fantastic, it's a fantastic result. One thing you can't see, which is just under my face, um, is that sort of we do a lot. Again, we do a lot of work in schools. And over the pandemic, we produced a free Python coding course designed to get you from no coding to being very confident using Python in about 12 weeks. And that's been seen by over 10,000 pupils worldwide. So, again, wherever there's a need, we will respond um, in the best way we can. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we ensure how have we made this success? There's loads and loads of programs out there. Lots of companies have got their own. And sometimes when we're speaking to clients, they have their own. And we have distilled our success into these five key areas, which I'll run through very quickly. And I think the first one is having that strong foundation. Often when people will start programs very, very passionately and they'll, they'll just start without much focus on what they want to achieve and their aims or more importantly, they will have lots and lots of things they want to achieve. And sometimes it feels very, very unmanageable. 
So I do recommend having an action plan with a series of easily achievable steps. Even if it's just putting out a newsletter in a year, that's a fantastic achievement if you're just doing this side of desk when you're trying to, you know, do your day job and all the things you have to do at home. You know, congratulate yourself for just achieving that. Ensure you have senior buy-in and sponsorship from day one. Ensure you've got someone very, very senior on your side and ensure that they're championing you. This is not necessarily about money or budgets. This is just about having someone that you can turn to to give you support, whether that be mentoring or just, you know, if you want to do a big event or something like that, you've got someone to ensure people you need to be there are there. And same thing, KPIs are really important. We all know data talks. Ensure that before you start, you know where you are and importantly, we measure these yearly, twice yearly, whatever works best for you, whatever you're trying to um, change, make sure you know which way you're going, because if, if something's not working, it means you can um, reevaluate very, very quickly. All of these programmes are, as we all know, run by people, and these are really dedicated, passionate people. And honestly, IT as a future would not achieve what we've achieved if it wasn't for these volunteers. So ensure that you recognise them, stretch them, and really appreciate everything they do. We write loads of feedback, we ensure we have celebration events. Things like this is really important. And governance, again, linked to strong foundations in a way, but actually if you start your programme, even if it's just two people, thinking that it's going to be run like a programme that you're, say, delivering for, for your client or your company, um, it makes things a lot easier. So from day one, we've always had a PMO structure. We have work stream leads. We have um, you know, a very strict governance and sort of accountability and responsibility structure. It means it's far easier for not just people to know what they're getting into if they want to volunteer, but it means the stuff is um, slipping for someone or if someone feels like they, they can't manage because they've got too much on their plate. They've got lots of teammates to support them because we treat it like, um, like a really, really structured programme. And again, that's why your sponsors are really important because they can really champion this across the firm. And this allows you to sort of really drive continuous feedback and ensure that you know you can look at your results versus your strategy. Collaborate, as I mentioned before in some of um, about recruitment, we're not here to do anyone's day job. That's not the point of one of these programs. It's just about to be the voice of women or um, we're here to just be the voice of women in tech at KPMG and we work really hard with HR recruitment, sort of marketing, but we aren't HR recruitment or marketing. And it's really important to know that because sometimes what I see is people try and bite off more than they can chew. And that's why these things fail, because people feel really overwhelmed. So take a step back. Can you achieve what you want to achieve? If not, get some really good allies on your side. And finally, um, and this is one that sort of has only come in really recently for us. We always only um, set this up to be a internal program. Um, we're starting to build things and take these um, our success to clients. We also take these things to our KPMG entities worldwide. It's really important that when you're developing it, make sure that you write down your best practice frameworks like we have, because then it makes it easier to not only share them with other people, but also to improve on them later. That has been a whirlwind tour of who IT so future is. So thank you very much. And I will be here live in a couple of seconds to answer any questions. If not, just drop me an email and um, find me on LinkedIn and I'll happily have a chat with anyone. Thank you very much.